I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter number 1. And as you do so, I, I want to ask you some questions this morning. Have you truly examined the world in which we live? Have you truly examined the world in which we live? I mean, you look around, our world is so much different than when many of us were growing up. We have seen terrorism not only invade other countries in the world, we have seen terrorism come to the very shores of this nation and do its destructive work. There are people who are so filled with rage and, and hate and bitterness and resentment that it seems like it is in control of so many people in so many ways. It is sad to see how racism has taken over so many people's lives and so many people's thoughts. And, 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 and doesn't, it doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what you do. It is very prevalent in our world today. This past week, I spent a couple of days in Plainfield, Indiana. I was meeting with uh, our state convention meeting for Indiana Southern Baptist, and I heard a a staggering, staggering idea or a staggering thought. And it said this, that the United States of America is now the third most pagan nation on the planet. Let me, let me say that again, just so that you catch this. The United States of America the good old USA, red, white, and blue, apple pie, and Chevrolet yeah. is now the third most pagan nation in the world. Now, we think of pagan nations, we think of places like China, India, Indonesia. You know, we think of those third world countries where, where there's Islam and, and Buddhism and, and all these other religions. My friend, the United States of America is the third most pagan nation on this planet. If that doesn't break your heart, then you need a reality check of what's really going on in our world. Here's what's happened. We've gotten comfortable, haven't we, church? We've gotten comfortable. We've gotten comfortable with our lives. As long as I've got money in the bank, as long as I've got that car to drive, as long as I've got that house, as long as i got this and i got that, i got my family, I've got all these things, everything else just really doesn't matter. We're not, we, we think about our lives. We think about our freedoms. Folks, as we've talked about, and, and, and I, like, like I said, I really don't care who it is that you're for in the election. It doesn't really matter to me. Vote whomever you wish. But I'm just going to tell you like it is. Donald Trump is not what's going to make America great again. And I don't say that as a political statement. I say that as a statement of reality according to the Word of God. And let me tell you right now, just so that you understand, I'll balance it out. Hillary Clinton's not going to make America great again either. It ain't gives any amens on that one. The only hope we have is not going to be in who is elected president, not who's going to be elected governor, not who's going to be elected to the school boards, or any other politician political uh, office, the only hope we have for America is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
When will we wake up to that reality? Oh, we say, yes, Brother Dennis, I believe that's true. But yet we'll go out here and we will argue and we will bicker about the presidential candidates as though they are the ones who is going to save us. God help us. I'm watching people who have been friends for 20 and 30 years literally splitting apart their friendships over this stuff. It is tragic. My friend, I look and I see the fact that there are murders after murders after murders being committed in the city of Chicago, Illinois, which is 30 miles from where we are right now. And what are we doing? We're sitting and we're all we're worried about is as long as I'm happy, as long as my bank account's full, I'm good to go. The gospel is still the solution. My friend, we, are, we have a needed gospel in a needed time. If ever, if ever, ladies and gentlemen, we ever needed Jesus, it is right here and right now in 2016. And my friend, we don't need him before the election. We need him right now. We're going to need him after the election. And we're going to need him in years to come after the election. Not because of who gets voted in or voted out. It is because we all need Jesus. A needed gospel in a needed time. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, I'm going to invite you to stand. Just one verse, that was all we're going to be reading today. But what a great and powerful verse this is. Verses up on the screen. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Father, thank you for your word. Pray you bless the reading of it, bless the preaching, bless those who hear. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to receive so that we may apply your word today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Get comfortable. Destiny asked me, she said, you're preaching today? And I said, yes. She says, uh-oh. <laughs> I said, hey, it's not my fault you didn't bring a picnic lunch. <laughs> I'm just teasing. We're not, you won't need a picnic lunch. Maybe you should have brought dinner, but that's, you know. The gospel is needed today. And I want to look at some things today from this verse to help us understand the importance of the gospel and why it is still the answer. I want you to notice first in the first very the first phrase of verse 16. Paul writes here, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. In this, Paul says, I am proud of the gospel i am proud of it he says i'm not ashamed i'm i'm not ashamed i'm not embarrassed to be associated with it i'm not ashamed to be affiliated with the thing that touches and changes the lives of men women boys and girls now i want you to understand something as paul writes this verse. Paul understood that Rome was a city of sophistication. I mean, it was the, the higher ups. It was people who lived there, they were intelligent. They were high class. They were, they were people who were educated and highly educated the people of rome were people who believed that anything they heard needed to have solutions to the massive amount of slavery greed lust and violence and basically their their thought was if that message did not meet those needs if it did not uh if it did not appeal to their <clears throat> to their intellect, 
if it didn't meet their criteria, well, <laughs> they just weren't going to listen. They weren't going to pay any mind to what was said. It wouldn't matter to them. Does that kind of sound familiar? We kind of live in that society today. If it, if it doesn't appeal to my mind, if it, if it doesn't challenge my, my intellect, can, can I tell you today, God is not just out to capture your mind, God is out to capture your heart. Let me, let me say that again. God's not out just out, out to capture your mind, He's out to capture your heart. He's out to capture your soul. He didn't just die to change your mind, He died to change your life. So it's not just about turning you into some educated person. It's about turning you into a person who is becoming different. <clears throat> you see, Paul knew that the gospel was not something that just appealed to the mind. It, the gospel didn't just directly address the issues of social justice. It didn't just directly address the issue of of, of slavery and greed and lust and violence. But may I suggest to you today that the gospel does hit those things. Because you see, the gospel brings change. It does bring change to the mind. It does bring change to the heart. The gospel is the answer of how to be reconciled to a holy God. That's the gospel. My friend, it's hard. It's hard for someone to tell me that they've been reconciled to God and yet their lives have not been changed. You see, unfortunately, we, we, have a, we, we live in this time now with, when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to preaching, what we want to do is we want to make it easy. If you just commit your life to, to God, you're, you're just going to be A-OK. -okay. And there's no addressing the issue of the sinfulness of your life. There's, there's no preaching of repentance. Very little preaching of the cross except just to flower it up and make it look pretty. May I say to you today, the cross is ugly. The blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ is very ugly. We, we watched that movie, The Passion of the Christ. My friend, that doesn't even scratch the surface of what happened to the Savior that day. Now, I will say this. I'm grateful that we are in a church where the preaching of the cross still occurs. I'm grateful we're in a church where the preaching of repentance of sin still takes place. I'm so grateful that we have a pastor who is bold and still says these things today. Some would say that guys like he and I are relics. We're, we're old-time, old-fashioned preachers. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I'll tell you right now, I'd rather be an old-fashioned preacher than a new-fashioned fool. <laughs> Amen? The truth of the matter is the gospel is the solution to what's going on here. Paul says, I'm proud of this. I'm proud. I'm not embarrassed by the gospel. I didn't know this about my dad for quite a while until I actually did find out after he passed away. Some of you who, who knew my dad... My dad was not one to give in over to public displays of emotion. You know, he was not one that, you know, was going to just openly, you know, tell you how proud he was of you or, or whatever. He, those things he kind of just kept to himself. And I, did, I didn't know, you know, I, you know, I went away to school and, and got my degree and, and I was doing all those things. And my mom told me this story. This is after my dad passed away several years ago. She said, you know, she said, son, you'll never know how proud your dad was of you. I said, well, he never said anything. She said, well, he may not have said it to you, but said, he was telling all those he worked with, those that he bowled with, those he went to church with. He said, anybody who'd listen, 
he was telling them about his son that was a minister. See, my dad wasn't embarrassed. Now, I got to tell you, there were times in my life that I did bring some embarrassment to the man. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably most of you can probably stand up and say amen. But I want you doing that. <laughs> but what I was so glad to know was that my dad wasn't ashamed. He wasn't embarrassed. He was proud to tell people that his son was a preacher. He was proud to tell him that I was a college graduate. And, and, and that, that just did something for me. That really helped me have even better thoughts and greater thoughts of my dad. My dad wasn't embarrassed. And I'm sure you could identify with that. I'm sure that, especially when, you, you know, when, you're, when your children have your, your grandchildren, Man, I can remember how it was for, for Pastor. You know, man, he couldn't, he couldn't wait. He couldn't shut up telling everybody about Tristan being born. And he, could, he couldn't wait. I remember him telling that he had that big old black eye after the crash. And, man, he was still going around telling everybody about it. Paul says, I'm not embarrassed. People want answers today that will appeal to their intellect. People today want answers that's going to deal with social justice. May, may I suggest to you today that the gospel answers those questions? The gospel answers the questions about racism. The gospel answers questions about social justice. If we would be reconciled to God, the Bible says, if we are reconciled to him, we have peace with him through the blood of his cross. Amen. The born-again believer has an answer which meets the greatest need. Listen, the greatest need in your life is not how to combat racism. The greatest need in your life is not how to get a bigger bank account. The greatest need of your life is not how to find employment. The greatest need of your life is to know that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior and Lord. Amen. That's the greatest need in the life of every individual. It is a public gospel when he said, I am not ashamed. And man, Paul, he wasn't ashamed. Look at, look at all the different people he preached to, all the people he witnessed to. It didn't matter what their status was in life. It didn't matter what their socioeconomic situation was. I mean, he talked to kings, and he talked to the lowest of the low. He went from talking to guys like Felix, who was a governor, and King Agrippa, we find, and he talked to people who were who was like a jailer, like the guy in Acts chapter 16. And, and, and would talk to the so-called intellectuals. We find that in the book of Acts as he stands on Mars Hill and preaches and has been around and looks around and talked about the unknown God as he talked about those idols in Athens. Paul talked to anybody and everybody. It didn't matter who they were. He wasn't ashamed of the gospel. So the gospel is a public gospel. I want you to know something else in this verse. Not only is it a public gospel, but it's also a powerful gospel. Listen what it says. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Notice what it says. It's, it's the power of God. The word power in this verse in the original New Testament language is the word dunamis. And you've heard, uh, we've talked about this word a lot. You, you find in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and in other places, <clears throat> the word dunamis is where we get our English word dynamite. Paul was saying that the omnipotence of God, that meaning God is all-powerful, that that power in his life, it leads to the conversion of a sinner. <clears throat> it is the power of God which is behind the changing of a life. See, that's why it was great. We had our, our New Believers class today, and I, and I, I shared in the class, it's not us who have to save anybody. You and I do not have the power to save one person. You don't own that power. I don't own that power. God owns that power. Amen. Now, your responsibility and mine 
if you want to think of power, we can think of dynamite. Your responsibility in mind is maybe to put the stick of dynamite there so God can make the stick explode. Our responsibility is to preach the word so the fuse can be lit for the stick of dynamite to explode. But it is the power of God. It's God's power. I mean, think about how powerful the gospel is. Think about your life for just a moment. Think about what your life was like before you came to Jesus. Maybe you're here today, your life was filled with addiction to various things, drugs, alcohol, pornography, name it, it was there, whatever. Maybe you're someone, maybe your life wasn't one of addiction, but maybe you're one that was raised in church. I don't know what your situation would be. But one thing that everybody has in common is that every person was bound for hell. You and I might come from different places. We may look different. We may talk differently. We may act differently. But I can tell you the one thing that you and I all have in common before we came to Jesus Christ is that we were on a road marked for hell. And think about how powerful the gospel is. That it takes a person who's on this road to hell, who's living a life that dishonors God, that is not pleasing to the Savior, and yet God's power can take that individual and turn their life around and make and turn them from being a hell-bound sinner into a heaven-bound saint. That is the power of God that does that. Not you, not me. It is God who does that through the gospel of Jesus Christ. God does the work. God is the one who does the changing. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. I've got it up on the screen here. It says, Can an Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Can a leopard take away its spots? Neither can you start doing good, for you have always done evil. You hear that? You can't change you. You may be sitting in this place today and you may say, you know what, I can, I can overcome. I can, I can make it happen for me. My friend, you can't make it happen for you. The Bible says it's impossible. A leopard can't change its spots. You can't instantly turn yourself from doing good, evil to good. Only God can do that through the cross of Jesus Christ. My friend, politicians cannot and do not possess the power to bring lasting change. They don't. Your family, your friends, and your finances have no power in helping change your life and your eternal destiny. Think about that for a moment. Listen, if your family could, they would have done so by now. If your money could have changed your life and your eternal destiny, it would have done so by now. If the politicians could change everything that would positively affect your life, they would have done so by now. But the one thing, or actually I should say the one person who has the power to change it all, is the everlasting God. It's He who changes the hearts and lives of men, women, boys, and girls. Yes, the cross, or yes, the gospel is a powerful gospel. But not only that, but it's also a purposeful gospel. Look again in verse 16. It says, it is, I says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. See, God didn't, again, God didn't just come to change your mind and give you religion. God didn't just come to this earth 
and be born of a virgin and walk among human beings and die on a cross and rise again from the dead and ascend back to the heavens, he didn't do that just to make you a nice person. He didn't do it just to get you a promotion in your job. He didn't do it just so that you wouldn't be sick a day in your life. God came and brought salvation. The word salvation here in this verse literally means deliverance. <clears throat> it literally means being rescued from all harm and danger. We're not just talking about your physical protection, we're talking your spiritual protection. God came to give you spiritual protection. He came, yes, he came to rescue you from the pit of hell. He rescued you. <clears throat> he gave you a hope. He gave you deliverance from spiritual death, spiritual defilement, spiritual deception, and spiritual destruction. God did all of that for you the moment you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and you said, yes, I am repenting of my sins and I am believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He rescued you from those things. <clears throat> God's purpose of the gospel is the salvation of the lost. Again, this is why I said to you, that the United States is the third most pagan nation on the planet. We've been so used to all these years that, you know, and, and listen, and I'm going to tell you, I am a proud Southern Baptist. I'm a proud Southern Baptist. You know, I was born Southern Baptist, born and bred a Southern Baptist, and I'll be one when I'm dead. And I grew up with the idea that we here as Southern Baptists in the United States of America, we sent the missionaries out. And we would fund them and we would make sure they went to, the, to every corner on the planet, to every people group on the planet, to make sure that every single man, woman, boy or girl around this world would hear the name of Jesus Christ. I grew up listening to the missionaries when they would come home on their furloughs. And they didn't have to come back and raise money. They'd come back and they'd have slides. Back in the days when we had to use screens and we had those little slide projectors, had those round ones. Yeah, exactly. Frank got it right. And had that little clicker in their hand and... And they describe these things. And I remember the images as a child of the missionaries who would be in Brazil or in the jungles of Africa or somewhere over in Asia. I remember hearing that as a little boy. That was how I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. Always knowing we sent out the missionaries. And now the very countries to whom we have sent missionaries over the years, yeah. Brother J.R., they're sending them now to us. Yeah. They're sending to us because they know we're the third most pagan nation on the planet and how we need Jesus. Again, my friend, if that doesn't break your heart, then there's something wrong with your heart. There's something wrong with where your worldview is. Right now, there's a, a friend of my wife's who's dying of cancer. And right now, the thing that's consuming my wife and I, praying we have an opportunity to share the gospel with her. I wish I could wave a wand over her and make her well. I wish I could wave a wand over you, Mr. Lois, and just make you well. I wish I could have waved a wand over you, Candida, with your breast cancer. But the one thing, even though I can't wave a wand over you all and make you well, the one thing I can do is I can preach Jesus to you. 
I can tell you that Jesus is still the answer for your life. It is a purposeful gospel. God came to bring salvation, not just to make us good people. He rescues sinners from their spiritual lostness. Brother, this, I don't understand those words. Let me tell you right now, if you don't understand, when I give an invitation here in a little bit, I'm going to invite you to come. And I'll explain it the very best I know how. There's others here who will be able to explain it to you. Because the one thing I can tell you is the Bible says, God is not willing that any should die, but that all should come to repentance. That's what the Bible says. I didn't write it. I didn't make it up. But God did. He wrote it. Because his heart is to seek and to save that which is lost. And listen, God knows where you are. You might say, well, I don't feel lost. Well, the Bible says you are, because if you're without Jesus Christ, you are lost. There's a quote that I found that says, objects are lost because people look where they are not instead of where they are. I lost a checkbook one time. That's a sick feeling. You lose a cell phone. That's a sick feeling. But I remember when I lost that, I remember when I lost that checkbook. Oh my goodness. I looked every place I could. Except the one place I didn't look. Which was underneath the easy chair in the home of one of my deacons in my first church. And thankfully they found it. And called me and said, Pastor, we have your checkbook. Now, I'm glad I could trust them with that checkbook until I went and got it. They could have very easily messed me up. But that was the one place I didn't look. I looked every other place except there. And it was right where I dropped it. My friend, many people are looking for economic salvation, political salvation, and social salvation. People think that their lives and circumstances could be upgraded. Everything is going to be fine. Can I just tell you? Even if racism could be fixed in our country, we would still be in trouble spiritually. Even if the economy could be fixed in our country, we would still be in trouble. Even if our morals and ethics could be fixed, we would still be in trouble. Even if we could get children to start once again respecting authority, we would still be in trouble. You know why? Because we still have men, women, boys, and girls who are still lost needing Jesus Christ. Fixing those things is nice, but it doesn't answer the big question. And that big question is, how are you going to come to God? It is God who sets sinners on the right path, and he does so by freeing them from the chains of their sin. One more thing. The gospel, it's a precise gospel. Notice what it says here in this verse. Romans 1.16 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. And listen to this. For everyone who believes for the Jew first and also also for the Greek some of your translations may have Gentile the non-Jews listen to what it says here we said it it's for everyone who believes see in this verse Paul speaks of how the gospel is activated in the life of those in whom it has contact. He says it comes, he says who believes. My friend, you must believe the gospel. There, there is no change without believing the gospel. You have to believe 
in who Jesus is. When we're talking the gospel, we're not just talking about the ABCs of salvation. We're literally, we are talking about Jesus Christ. We are talking about who he is as a person. We are talking about the fact that he was born of a virgin. We're talking about the fact that he lived a perfect life. We are talking about the fact that he died a cruel death on the cross. We're talking about the fact that he rose again in victory on the third day after he died. We're talking the entire thing. We're talking about the entirety of Jesus Christ, not just death and resurrection. That's right. We have, to, we have to believe him. It says in Romans 11, I'm saying Hebrews 11, 6, for he who comes to God must come by faith. They must believe that God exists. They must believe in him. Not just believe in what he did, but believe in him. Trusting in him. Believing the gospel, which is the entirety of of who Christ is. Believing Him. But not only does it say that it, it talks about activating through faith, but it's a faith that's ongoing. See, that's the thing. It's not just, hey, it's not just a one-time event, but it's a faith that continually transforms your life. See, again, we've said it time and time again in this place. That God, God didn't bring you here just to gain information. God's brought you here so you would be tra in transformation. Now there are some who don't want to hear the fact that we are in the process of being sanctified. We've had people in this church who have literally said, that doesn't, that's not scriptural. I say they're in error. They're wrong. Yes, we are sanctified when we are saved. But, pro, but sanctification is an ongoing event. It's growing. It's understanding God's will for your life. It's understanding what God has for you. It's understanding that God is making you into a person who he wants to be holy and righteous, not of your own, but his holiness and his righteousness activated in your life through his son. You see, what I like here, it also says not just the fact of where it's activated, but it's for everyone. Notice what he says there. It is for everyone. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The gospel knows those social barriers. The gospel does not care if you're rich or poor or middle class. The gospel is not about just for the rich folk only or for the poor people or for the upper middle class or lower middle class that's not biblical the gospel knows those social barriers the gospel knows those financial barriers the gospel knows those cultural barriers the gospel Jesus doesn't care what nationality you are. Gospel, the gospel doesn't care. Jesus doesn't care if you're white, black, brown, yellow. He doesn't care if your eyes are straight or slanted. He doesn't care if your hair is brown, black, or gray. He doesn't care if it's pink, purple, or polka dot. The gospel doesn't know color. That's why it absolutely, almost say it anyway, it just fries my bacon. When I hear people going around, well, I mean, and, and, and having this as attitude about, well, now, you know, I, you know I, I, it's the gospel's for me. What are we going to understand? It, it's beyond me to think of how a Christian can be a racist. It, it's beyond me. I mean, it says in this passage, it says, it's for the Jew first, and what's that word there? Also. Also for the non-Jew. It's for the Jew and for the Gentile. 
It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter where you've lived. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It is for everybody. Jesus didn't die for just one particular type of people. He died for all types of people. Well, Brother Dennis, no, I, I, I live a lifestyle that I'm homosexual. Listen, you repent of your sins and believe the gospel, God will save your soul. Well, Brother Dennis, I've been addicted to, to this, particular, to this particular, th particular thing. If you, believe the, if you repent of your sins and believe the gospel, God will save you. Well, now I'm, you know, I, I'm from Kentucky. God will save you if you're from K Kentucky, okay? I'm getting that look from my wife. Doesn't matter where you're from. Listen, one of the great things about this church is, man, I look around and I see all types of folks in here. Man, I look and I see black folks, and I see Hispanics, I see whites. I see people that come from all different walks of life. You know what that just reminds me? Is that this is exactly how it's going to look in heaven. And the, and the good news is, neither are there going to be, because see, actually, there won't be any such thing as black people and white people in heaven. We're all just going to be people in heaven who are born again. But people who come from Korea are going to be there. People who come from China are going to be there. People who come from India are going to be there. People who come from the Soviet Union or Russia are going to be there. People who are born in Europe are going to be there. People who are born in South America are going to be there. And listen, even if you were born on that God-forsaken continent of Antarctica, you'll be there also. <laughs> the gospel is for everyone. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone. I came to understand a long time ago the reason why no matter if you're a Christian or not you know why you shouldn't be racist? Because I've discovered I've seen black people bleed I've seen Hispanics bleed I've seen white people bleed I've seen men bleed I've seen women bleed I've seen little boys bleed I've seen little girls bleed and you know one thing I've always discovered is they all had the same color blood. It's all red. And you know one thing I can guarantee you? The day that Jesus Christ was crucified on Calvary's cross, and before they even crucified our Savior to that cross, and they beat that man within an inch of his life, and they put a crown of thorns, and they literally forced it into his skull, I guarantee you the blood that came out of him was also red. Yes, sir. The gospel is for everyone. Everyone needs to hear the gospel. Whether you live in Highland, Indiana, whether you live somewhere else here in the United States of America, or whether you live somewhere else in this world, everyone needs the gospel. It is the power of God for everyone. So here's the point. The gospel is for the whole entire world. The gospel is for that neighbor who could be a real pain in your backside The gospel is for that person who cuts you off. The gospel is for that person on your job who just gives you the worst time in the world. The gospel is for that teacher that you just flat don't like because they give you too much homework. The gospel is for that family member who ridicules you, persecutes you, 
gives you all kinds of grief because you're a born-again follower of Jesus Christ. The gospel is for that person. You see, the gospel is what's going to change somebody's heart. You're not going to change them. I'm not going to change them. But I know someone who can. His name is Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're someone who's not been changed by the gospel. As I said a few moments ago, I'm about to extend an invitation to you personally. If you're here today and your life is not what you thought it ought to be or should be or the way you want it to be, and you've been trying and trying and trying, but it seems like you can't get anywhere fast, and it seems like everything is everything you touch just seems like it turns out wrong. May I invite you today to come and repent of your sins and believe the gospel. My invitation to you is to place your personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, to deliver you from your sins. Maybe you're here today, and you would say, Brother Dennis, I know the gospel is for everybody, but I've not been sharing the way I should. My friend, I'm not asking you to go out tomorrow and book a flight to some foreign country and preach the gospel unless you believe that's what God would have you do. Then that's fantastic. But what about that family member or that friend or that coworker or that boss or that teacher or whoever it is? How about starting with that individual? Maybe you've been so busy trying to argue the, the political stuff that you have really forgotten that Jesus is the answer. And that if America is ever going to be great again, and believe me, I, I think America is still great, maybe not the way she once was, but I think America is still great. <laughs> but if America is ever going to be anything that you think it ought to be or that I think it ought to be, it's not going to be because politicians change it. It's because we as the church are offering Jesus Christ as the only answer for America. Father, thank you for the privilege to preach your word. Father, we are, we are in a mess in our nation. We are in trouble. Violence, lack of respect for authority, all these things are the hot button issues and these are the things that many people will camp upon because we fall victim to what the media says and we believe everything they have to tell us. But Lord, we know the truth of the matter is that the only hope that anybody ever has is Christ and Christ alone. So Father, I pray right now that your people will rally and Lord, they will take serious the mandate to go and to make disciples, that they will take the mandate seriously to be salt and light, that they indeed will believe with every fiber of their being that Jesus is the only solution. Lord, may we remember that Jesus was the solution for our lives and that he remains the only solution. Lord, if there's someone here today whose life needs to be changed by the power of the gospel, they've never repented of their sin, they've never believed the gospel, then I pray this would be their day to realize that you came to deliver sinners from the penalty and the power of sin. 
Lord, I pray you would speak and move in our hearts and lives through this invitation. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.